Okay. Welcome everyone. Um, this is welcome to King's College London. Welcome to the first week back in classes. Uh, welcome to the new academic term. So my name is Christine Chang and I am a senior lecturer in the Department of War Studies at King's College London and I teach on the uh, Masters in Conflict Security and Development. To those of you who are in our new MA program, special welcome to all of you. Um, really glad to have you in London. Really good to see you all in person uh, for the first time in a very, very long time. So this is a panel on the future of Afghanistan. And uh, I've got some really amazing people here joining us today uh, to have this difficult conversation. And I promise you it will be a difficult conversation, but an honest and as I promised to you in um, in advertising it, a brutally honest one. So, so um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. And I wanted to thank Abdullah who, Kumjani, who's on our panel for helping me co-convene this. And it basically came out of a, a dinner that we had and some conversations, and we felt it was really important to to bring out some some different Afghan voices into this conversation that haven't really been amplified as much as as we would have liked. So. I'm um, really grateful to Abdullah for you know, getting this going together with me. Um, so I just, I think I feel like I should set the scene a little bit. And, but before I do any of that, actually, there's, there are a couple of people that I, I really want to send a big thank you to. Um, the, the Petersons um, are, I think, online with us somewhere in this crowd. So Christian Peterson, Effie, Salida, um, and their daughter, Lydia, thank you so much. So for those of you who don't know about the, the Petersons, um, we have two Peterson scholars with us who are former alumni of the, the scholarship program. And the scholarship was established actually for in, in a very sad way uh, because it's named after the Petersons son, Alexandros, who was killed in, in Kabul um, in, in a bombing. So the, the scholarship was named in commemoration of him. And the good thing that has come out of that, obviously, is we've had many amazing students come through our program, two of whom are here today speaking on our panel about Afghanistan. So um, it feels almost like a, a full circle event in many ways. So I wanted to say a shout out to them. Thank you very much. Uh, in many ways, this, this panel wouldn't be possible without you, and it certainly wouldn't be as rich without um, the help and support that you've given to Kings. So thank you for that. Um, just to say a few words about setting the scene for today. I mean, we've all thought a lot about what has happened in the past month and a half or so. Um, some of the people on our panel are lucky to be alive, frankly, today, and and I'm grateful to have them here and in one piece and, and wholly intact to be able to talk to us. Uh, I, you know, I think all of us have many different emotions as, as we've been thinking through um, what has been happening in Afghanistan and the past 20 years of involvement and intervention and invasion. And then now we're back to the Taliban uh, taking over the country again. So I think we're here today really just to talk about the future. Uh, and I've set a few questions for our speakers today to think about. I'll put them into the chat for all of you afterwards as well. Um, the three things that I've, the three questions that I've posed to them are, well, the first one is, what are the most likely scenarios for the future of Afghanistan? And I've asked them to feel free to focus on Taliban rule, on the security situation, the economic collapse, terrorism, human rights, women's rights, whatever it is they feel like speaking about specifically. Um, the second question is really, how should the Western policy community respond to these scenarios? How about the UN? And how about other external actors outside the West, like China, like Russia, Iran, Pakistan? So I'll let them to pick and choose amongst those as they please. And then the last question is a more general one. And it's about the lessons that we've learned. So what lessons should external actors draw from the Afghan experience over the past 20 years? So the three of them are welcome to answer any, all, or none of these questions as they so wish. And we'll speak for about 10 minutes each. Uh, and then we'll go to a big Q&A. 
everybody's being recorded right now. So if you have an objection to being recorded, um, you might want to, you know, not raise your hand and, and say anything um, that you wouldn't want to have recorded. If you do want to ask questions, you can do so in the Q&A box at the bottom. So feel free to pop in your questions as we go along. Feel free also to comment on things as we go along. This is going to be, and I ask you all to be respectful uh, in the seminar. I know it's going to touch on some really difficult things at times. And if the situation gets a bit dicey, I will be the ruthless chair that people know I am, and uh, I will either mute you, or if it gets too bad, then we will ask you to leave or actually just kick you out of the seminar. So um, just, just be mindful, please be respectful in your tone and how you address people and, and with your questions as well. So um, yeah, having said that on a, on a cheerier note, I, I think we can, can just about get started. I am going to give the speakers a two minute warning. The speaking order will start with Fatin and then uh, we'll go to Najib and then we'll go to Nargis and then Abdullah. Um, we'd really welcome your interventions and I will invite you all to actually come in online with your questions by inviting you to be panelists and then you can ask the questions directly to the panelists yourself um, in the Q&A section. So when we get to that, be prepared. I will I will call on you if you if you want to. If you don't want to be called, then just specify that when you put down your question, okay? Um, I'm looking for lots of good interaction, a good genuine discussion, and hopefully really getting to the heart of some of these really difficult issues. Okay, now I get to actually introduce my amazing speakers. So um, Professor Fatin Gosen is currently a distinguished professor in the School of Government and Public Policy and faculty in the School of School in the School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies and the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Arizona. She holds the Melody S. Robidoux Foundation Fund Professorship. She's re received several research awards, including a Minerva Initiative funded by the Department of Defense and the U.S. Army Research Office. And Batten's research current research focuses on enemy images as obstacles to cooperation, ethics and field work, forced migration, and transitional justice. And she specializes in, in looking at Afghanistan. So I'm really delighted to have her here with us. Um, our second speaker, Najib Sharifi, is president of the Afghan Journalist Safety Committee, the AJSC. His work has appeared in lots of different international outlets, including Foreign Policy Magazine, Al Jazeera English, Huffington Post, and the National Interest. He's also written for think tanks, including Brookings. He's reported and worked closely with the New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, BBC, and CNN. And uh, spectacularly, on behalf of the HASC, he accepted the 2017 International Press Institute International Media Supports Free Media Pioneer Award. And of course, he was a Peterson Scholar in our MA in Conflict Security and Development Program at King's. Uh, our third speaker, um, Nargis Nihan, was until very recently the Acting Minister of Mines, Petroleum and Industries for the Afghan government. Previously, she served as Director General of the Treasury Department of the, at the Ministry of Finance. She was also the Senior Advisor to the Minister of Education and Advisor to the Minister of Higher Education. And she also has a background um, in starting a women's rights NGO. So really delighted to have you here, especially um, having just gone through a long drive and, and grateful that you got all the tech working, Nargis. And then our last speaker and my co-convener uh, is Abdullah Kanjani, who was the Deputy Minister of Coordination, Strategy and Policy in Afghanistan's State Ministry for Peace. So in this role, he coordinated the peace process with the Taliban on behalf of the Afghan government. Before joining the Afghan government, he was editor in chief at One TV, and he was also a prominent broadcast journalist with his own TV show. Mr. Kandani holds an MA in Conflict Security and Development from King's, where he was, again, another one of the recipients of the Peterson Scholarship. So we've got a spectacular panel, and I'm happy to hand it over um, to Professor Goldstein. Thank you, Professor Chang. Um, first of all, thank you not only for the kind introduction, but for putting it together along with um, Mr. Kanjani and I just want to say it's an honor for me to be sharing virtually the stage with um, with you all. Um, and so, as an academic, I think I've been given the role to to provide a understanding, particularly from an international community perspective, in terms of some of the challenges uh, moving forward. And I want to say that 
I'm going to share my screen um, and time myself. Um, here we go. Um, this presentation today that I'm going to be presenting is primarily part of a short piece that I'm working on with a um, Afghan colleague, um, uh, Professor Atal Ahmadzai. And so we're trying to think about the international community and some of the pitfalls they're going to be facing as they are negotiating and talking with uh, Taliban. So mostly I'll focusing on question two, but I'm happy in Q&A to talk about, you know, question three uh, on some of the lessons um, learned. So first off, let's just put it in, in a current situation context, right? Taliban currently faces a delicate balance um, between sustaining loyalty and cohesion of their fighters while not being labeled as a pariah state by the international community. I think everything so far has demonstrated to us they do not want to go back to the era of the 1990s where they were only recognized by three states. But more importantly, we have to think about how did they get there? And part of how they got there was gaining legitimacy by providing local services, primarily through the co-option of services that were being provided by the government and the INGOs. However, moving forward, this is gonna be problematic because 75% to 80%, depending on the number that you're looking at, the budget is financed by foreign aid, sanctions are still in place, and the state financial resources are mainly held abroad and frozen. For example, uh, 7 billion out of Afghan Central Bank's 9 billion is held by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, recently, also the IMF, after the takeover, blocked access to $460 million that were supposed to be um, you know, allotted for COVID responses and help. Um, EU last year had negotiated over a $12 billion aid package uh, that would be provided over the next four years. However, EU um, president and other uh, uh, foreign ministers have said that this is going to all halt and uh, everybody's waiting to see. Um, however, more recently at the United Nation, Qatar's Sheikh um, Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani stressed that the necessity of continuing dialogue with Taliban because boycott only leads to polarization and reactions, whereas dialogue could bring in positive results. Um, also, Pakistan's foreign minister maintained and warned that engagement with Taliban is necessary uh, because otherwise a humanitarian and economic collapse in Afghanistan remains a real threat. Yet, till today, no country has recognized Taliban as the official government of Afghanistan. Now, some people, you know, there's a huge debate, and uh, my uh, colleagues and panelists can probably talk a little bit more about that. But as an international relations scholars, some of the things that I am looking at and some of the dangers ahead is what I'm calling a Taliban-like resistance movement. And what, what do I mean by that? And we've seen some people beginning to talk about it much more, moving away from kind of like this, this typical civil war uh, scenario to talking and thinking about what's happening outside of Afghanistan and not necessarily inside. Uh, for example, politicians, uh, many of the politicians um, and senior military figures are now in neighboring Tajikistan. Um, they represent Afghanistan's various ethnic and religious groups. This alliance also includes uh, warlords and ethnic power brokers who are cooperating currently from outside Tajikistan. Now, they're not strong yet, right? They, they, they still don't have a ide ideology that they unite behind other than they're anti-Taliban so far. Um, also, they're weak. They're not strong yet. Uh, however, with time, if a government in exile really does take shape, there's still the prospect of a regional proxy battle akin to what happened in Libya. Now, it could also fail. Think about this attempt by Syrian um, groups uh, to try to do this. However, I would say Syria was a much stronger state than um, Afghanistan. And so it might, would be more like Libya than really um, Syria. And so this gives them, they have some time um, to wait and, and, and uh, watch what's going to happen inside. They can regroup, uh, rearm, and try to gain support for an anti-Taliban movement. And let's, let's remember, that was Taliban strategy, right? Taliban was defeated October 14, 2001. And they primarily retreated to Pakistan. And um, they bade their time before making their comeback. And so while many of us would say civil war in the typical definition um, may not occur currently, um, this does not mean it might not happen. So what are some of the things that we would want the international community to think about and some of the pitfalls to be aware as they negotiate with Taliban moving forward? 
First, with respect to government and governance. So Taliban has made it uh, clear that they are following um, Islam, that this is the uh, the Emirate, uh, um, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. However, let's be honest, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation has over 57 member states spread throughout Asia, North Africa, and the Middle East. There is no one uniform Islamic government. Uh, governments range from a presidential democratic republic, think of Indonesia, uh, the hybrid of theocratic and democratic institutions, thinking of Iran here, to monarchy, like in Saudi Arabia, and everything in between among these 57 member states who are who all define as being Islamic or Muslim majority. Um, another thing that, it, that varies across these Muslim states is their basic service provisions. Um, There's some that have established uh, effective governance structures um, where they mimic, um, um, I, would, I don't want to call them Western or, but, but developed nation uh, uh, governance structures in terms of how you effectively uh, provide services. And so here I'm thinking of governments like Malaysia, like Qatar, like Indonesia, but there's also the less effective governance, like in Libya, like in Sudan, and currently with the war in uh, Syria. So one important warning for the international community is that we should not equip the Taliban with the shield of cultural relativity or exclusive jurisdiction rights that they will subsequently use against both the Afghans and the international community itself by saying it is either you know Western way or the Islam Islamic way. The Islamic way, there's no one Islamic way. And so there is room to negotiate here, even while they try to push Islam as the, the barrier or the condition. The second thing is um, international uh, uh, rule of law and uh, gender, right? Again, here, Islam is not a monolithic religion, while there is definitely the Quran, the Hadith, uh, there's a lot of uh, interp different interpretations of this uh, uh, Sharia law. The divisions are not restricted only to the main, two main sects, uh, Sunni and Shia, but all existing sects of fractions. Um, even a deep and ever widening crack exists between the Diobani sect, which is the ideological orientation of the Taliban, and a significant divide even within that between the Indian Diobani school and the Pakistani Diobani school. So lots of variation. It's so easy from a Western perspective to kind of sum up into these Sunni, Shiite, or, you know, um, uh, one sect versus another. The, the interpretations can vary a lot. There's also differences in a variety of issues, area, including human rights and gender. Think Albania, think Kosovo and Turkey on gender and women's rights versus Mali, Saudi Arabia and Sudan. I would even say Saudi Arabia in the last couple of years has even been opening up much more in terms of women's rights than it has ever been since its existence or establishment in 1932. Uh, recently, Pakistani foreign minister said girls and women uh, should be allowed to go to school, college, and university. Yet we see the president of the current college university declaring that he did not think women should be going to the university. So as such, any claim of religious relative fundamental human rights by the Taliban is political and strategic, political in terms of safeguarding their malicious intentions from international condemnation and strategic in uh, subjugating the Afghan population through severe uh, punitive measures and um, retribution. So what can the international community do and where does that leave us? Well, we need to stop promoting false dichotomy. It does not have to be the Western way or the Taliban way. What needs to happen is the Afghan way, whatever that may be, um, especially given the multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, uh, dimension of Afghanistan. And as a Lebanese, I completely understand that that is not easy and by no means Lebanon has not figured it out yet. But there has been, we've been successful in some periods of our time. Also, the international community does have leverage um, through two mechanisms, recognition. Taliban needs international recognition and legitimacy. In fact, recently it requested to be recognized as the official government of the UN. Also, when it comes to economic aid, economic collapse is looming. It will occur. And uh, WHO recently said that it would need 38.5 million to meet humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan for just the next four months. We've had hospitals shut down, um, um, basic services not being provided, which means more outbreaks, health outbreaks, um, 
uh, may occur. And so as a result, I think this is a ripe opportunity for the international community uh, to start thinking, coalescing around a strategy. However, again, it should not be the Western way um, um, as the only way moving uh, forward. And with that, I think I have four seconds left. Thank you so much. <laughs> Beautifully done. You are spot on. Thank you, Fatin. Not typical for an academic, but I did my best. <laughs> I know. That is so true. So true. Uh, let me move on to Najib. So um, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. And it's, uh, it's, it's great to see you um, uh, after uh, many years. And it's, um, I'm very honored to be part of this. Uh, Panel. Actually, this is this is my uh, first uh, the first panel that I'm attending. Uh, actually, going through the shock of you know what happened in Afghanistan and leaving Afghanistan in that catastrophic way it did take a huge emotional toll. I have to admit. Um, so, um, but anyways, um, um, I think when we look at the future of Afghanistan, we are facing with a lot of unknowns at this stage. Um, Unknowns in the sense that, um, um, you know, how will the Taliban behave in terms of governance? What will happen to the economy? How will be able to, you know, um, address the issue of security? And um, more importantly, what's gonna, uh, what, how their approach will be towards the issue of human rights, particularly women's rights and issues such as press freedom and. Um, um, so forth. And one crucial factor that uh, Professor Fatton um, outlined as well, and that's the factor of resistance. Um, uh, because um, there is um, obviously um, an extensive spirit of defiance, you know, for the Taliban rule within Afghanistan. And how that um, evolves, you know, that's a matter that um, depends on a lot of questions, particularly the Taliban behavior towards the people and whether they agree to the formation of an inclusive government uh, or not. Because um, um, if they don't agree to the formation of an inclusive government, you know, where we um, all different ethnic groups see their presence in the political system and, um, you know, see themselves represented there, I don't think we'll be able to achieve political stability in Afghanistan. Uh, with regards to the governance, you know, so far the Taliban have not been able to, you know, offer governance. And this is very natural because for militant groups, as historically we have witnessed, you know, it's not easy for them to turn into political entities, particularly when it comes to offering governance, you know. They can't because the very foundational formation of such groups is, is just made for fighting, not for offering services. You know, so um, talking to people inside Afghanistan, you know, we see a huge amount of uh, outrage and outcry. You know, because the economy is really, really bad; it's collapsing. You know, um, rampant poverty is emerging, and uh, at the same time, you know, there's no prospect of governance. You know, um, there. And at the same time, we have witnessed um, some really serious human rights atrocities in the past couple of weeks, um, which have um, um, which has created a lot of uh, resentment on the part of the public. Um, well, this is the local factor, you know, uh, that uh, will determine the future of Afghanistan as to whether it will grow. Um, uh, then we have the regional um, aspects. Um, so. Um, we have uh, countries such as Pakistan, who is an entrenched staunch supporter of the Taliban and it's, you know, lobbying on behalf of the Taliban to get it recognized. But at the same time, we have another power, you know, Iran, which I believe is still observing to see what's going to happen or where the situation will evolve. And we have Russia, India. Um, India considers itself the biggest loser in the region in the, in the, by, with the takeover of Afghanistan. So, and one very, very, very crucial factor is China. Um, we see that China is already making overtures in terms of um, um, finding a way. I will, it will be too soon to say that to 
grew in Afghanistan to exploit the you know, mineral um, deposits of the country because well, the Chinese have been very, very judicious in terms of you know, how to approach um, you know, when it comes to, to, to going about a new country. But we are already seeing that the Chinese are showing interest in terms of incorporating Afghanistan in the Grand City project. On the one hand, and on the other hand, um, exploiting um, the vast mineral reserves of Afghanistan. You know, I mean, that's something that um, the Chinese are very, very thirsty for. So um, how much, what, how big the role of the China, how big of a role of China will play in Afghanistan? Uh, that's something to be seen, because if the Chinese offer um, financial aid for Afghanistan and at the same time offer a strong, you know, backing to the country, um, to, to the Taliban, you know, then it will solidify Taliban's position in terms of consolidating their power in the country. So, again, that's um, something that uh, will be determined in the coming weeks and probably months. Um, uh, another, there is a, another huge danger, um, and that's the danger, the danger of another proxy war, um, regional proxy war um, in the battlefield of Afghanistan. Um, so um, as Professor Faitan earlier mentioned, you know, that um, we have uh, a significant number of, you know, um, commanders, generals, you know, political leaders uh, who are in Tajikistan preparing for another for, for, for basically resumption of resistance. And um, how much traction it receives and how much the regional powers, you know, will provide support to, um, you know, to, to that network. Uh, that's another question. That's again, a, a question that will be answered later um, because that could change or influence the equation of events in Afghanistan. And um, one other uh, factor that's, that's remained extremely mysterious in Afghanistan, particularly not just now, but also when we were in Afghanistan, for example, and we were seeing um, the moves and then a lot of subversive action, that, that's the group, I mean, Afghanistan-based ISIS. And so, um, well, many people discount, you know, the presence of ISIS, but uh, in the very first day when the Taliban took over, they manifested and uh, that they are their capability in terms of you know launching massive attacks at the same time you know for example in one day and probably within four or five hours we have four or five explosions in Kabul, which was carried out by isis um uh, so they have been silent since, since then but that does not mean you know that they don't hold the potential to um wage massive attacks and to challenge the Taliban, you know, in, in some fronts. Again, the scale of their capability to challenge the Taliban, that's yet to be seen. So, and the third um, um, factor, uh, well, the other factor which has to do with, um, you know, the regional countries is the fight against extremism. Um, uh, with the, um, takeover of power by the Taliban, the extremist groups and extremist networks have been involved, emboldened, you know, and inspired inside Afghanistan um, and throughout the region and even beyond, you know, because at the end of the day, if you look deep into the group and their ideological formation, it's not at the end of the day, it's not a political entity or a political group, it's a very deeply ideological group, you know, coupled with, you know, ethnic and tribal, um, um, you know, uh, component and um, transnational and regional terrorist groups. So um, with such an ideological group coming to power, um, well, how wise, rational will that political behavior be? That's one main question. The other main question is, is uh, the other important question is that this has already inspired and emboldened you know, extremist networks you know, throughout the region. So will the regional countries you know, take this threat serious and unite behind you know, um, cooperating to, you know, to, to fight or to counter 
this potentially catastrophic um, challenge, which is violent extremism. Um, you know, that's something that has to do with this wisdom of the regional countries, but so far I don't see any signs of that, unfortunately. And the third factor, you know, that will determine the course of events in Afghanistan is the international community or the Western countries, particularly the US. Um, um, again, with the Chinese making overtures towards Afghanistan, I don't think the United States will remain that silent about that issue. How will the position of the United States, you know, and the Western, its Western allies, evolve towards Afghanistan? And particularly when now that the China is coming into play, that's again a question or a matter that needs to be seen. But I believe, you know, that. The, um, you know, um, particularly with the ambitions of the um, Chinese state, you know, to incorporate Afghanistan as part of the CPEC and to exploit the mineral, uh, you know, deposits of the country. Um, that could also um, enhance the possibility or the likelihood of new proxy battles in the country in Afghanistan. Well, what's really unfortunate is who's paying the price is poor Afghan people. So, and um, so this was what all I had for now, uh, Professor. That is perfect, also spot on time. Thank you, Major. Um, our third speaker is Nargis. Thank you so much for joining us. And I know you've gone through a lot in order to get here and, and uh, I really appreciate it you being able to join us. Thanks. You're just on mute. Thank you very much. Can you hear me very well? Yes, okay. Well, uh, first of all, I have to uh, thank the organizer of uh, today's program uh, for arranging this honest discussion uh, that I believe we need to have a lot of them. Uh, to be able to reflect on what happened in Afghanistan and what is what are the likely scenarios as you questioned, the lessons learned to make sure that we, whatever way we are choosing and the strategies that we are uh, adopting now, we make sure that at least we are not repeating what we have been doing in the last 20 years uh, in Afghanistan. I'll give you um, some in this information from Afghanistan before um, going to uh, the scenarios that we have and, uh, and as well as the lessons learned that we have and the recommendation that we have for intervention of the international community. Uh, economically, as you know very well, Afghanistan is going through uh, a crisis, uh, there are news. Uh, we have gotten to the point that even uh, civil servants are not paid for months. And uh, several server, uh, several server uh, institutions were the main source of employment in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, people do not have jobs anymore. Even men have not been able to get their salaries because uh, the money is being frozen. There is no fiscal cash in Afghanistan. And even if uh, we have uh, service of uh, Western Union and, and MoneyGram, uh, if you don't have physical cash inside the country, uh, that is not resolving the issue. Uh, with regard to human rights, if we look at the situation, as you know very well, that girls are being banned from going to school uh, for secondary uh, from sixth class onward. And it's exactly today, the 11 days that boys are going to school, but girls are being banned once again uh, uh, from going to school. On top of that, uh, we have more than 2 million uh, uh, women that they are uh, the breadwinners of their family. They have been working in both public and private sector, and they have been feeding their families. But it has been one month now that uh, they don't know about their uh, situation, and none of them are uh, allowed to go to uh, work. And both uh, in the public and private sector, uh, they are facing basically uh, like a situation where they are, uh, they are like prisons in, in their own country. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the Taliban have already introduced segregated education uh, in the higher education, and they do not allow women and men to work together, study together, or have a 
any kind of interaction in the public space. Um, and on top of that, uh, today, actually, I uh, read in the news that even they have closed the shelters that they were uh, home to many of the victims of the domestic violence, and they have shifted all those women to the jails, all those jails that previously they had the killers, they had the murderers, and they had the side attackers uh, in those jails, those are being released, but instead of them, the victims of the violence, women, they are being placed in those jails. So this is the situation that we have right now uh, in Afghanistan. And, um, and on top of that, uh, Afghan people are much more aware and we find it highly uncomfortable when we see that uh, our neighbor Pakistan is coming forward and is literally interfering in all our affairs. And, um, and on top of that, um, they are and their interference and their interaction right now is very destructive in Afghanistan and it's not uh, uh, unfortunately constructive. And that is creating uh, another layer of um, conflict uh, between Afghan and, uh, and, and Pakistan. And this time it has gotten to the point that actually people are more resistant and they are more sensitive to what Pakistan is doing because somehow one way or the other way, everybody is holding Pakistan responsible for what is happening right now in Afghanistan. Uh, India feels like Afghan very much betrayed. Uh, not only by the Pakistan and Taliban, but uh, also by the, uh, by the international community. But it's not only India. The European countries also feel betrayed because the US, they made the decision, but they shared very little information on the strategy and what exactly they were doing to the European countries. So on one hand, they did call on, on all these allies when they came to Afghanistan, but they did not cooperate and coordinate with these allies when they left Afghanistan. Uh, so it was a very irresponsible withdrawal, not only in case of Afghan people, but also to the other allies in the uh, region and as well as in the West that uh, that news was having. Uh, there, there was uprising um, um, uh, by women group, many of them, and we were in contact with them and uh, that they took the, all the risk to be able to get out and raise their voice. And that actually proved many of the points that Taliban made before by saying that they represent the whole Afghanistan, people do not have any problem with them, and people actually support the kind of governance and the Islamic Emirate that they had. And those uprisings and, uh, and, and this rush of the people to not only Kabul airport, but also to other in the countries that were in the provinces that they are have, they're having borders with other countries. Uh, thousands of people were waiting for, for weeks uh, to be able to get out of Afghanistan. While many people are saying that, oh, people, because of having a better life, they were rushing to Kabul airport to be able to get out to US or other Western countries for a better life. But look, if people are going to, uh, to the provinces like Herat, uh, Kandahar, Nangarhar, where they were just waiting for their night uh, to get out of uh, Afghanistan and go to Uzbekistan, Pakistan, Iran, and Tajikistan, there is no better life waiting for them there. They are going to be refugee and in a much more worse situation, but still they wanted to get out of Afghanistan. And that shows the level of people's frustration and fear uh, about the uh, governance of, uh, of Taliban. So on top of that, uh, what we saw that Taliban, uh, everybody that they kept on uh, promoting Taliban saying that they have changed, they have become moderate, and they're going to have a different uh, kind of governance this time. We saw that the only change that we see is that they want to be connected with the international community, they want to be recognized by the international community, they want to have their political representation in different uh, uh, countries. But in terms of governance, in terms of ruling the people, in terms of atrocities, do you don't see any change in the modality of the Taliban. And on top of that, we also hear about the fragmentation within the Taliban, and they're having fragmentation both horizontal and as well as vertical. On horizontal side, uh, you see that uh, the foot soldiers are not listening to uh, the Taliban uh, leaders anymore. So uh, Mujahid, uh, several times he came to media and he kept on uh, calling on all soldiers that we have announced a general am public amnesty and you should not um, you should not kill or torture any uh, any uh, national security 
security force, uh, anyone working for national security force people or for the government. But we saw that not only men, they had those atrocities, even on women, a police woman that uh, in, in one of the provinces, uh, she was shot in front of her husband and boy when she was six months pregnant, just because she was a police woman. So the, 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 the Taliban on the ground level, they are not listening to Taliban in the Kabul anymore. And every one of them in their own province are trying to come up with their own list of rules and regulations and trying to govern the provinces, which is bringing more not only confusion, but also more fragmentation and more grievances at the community level. And at the higher level, there is still uh, uh, fragmentation and disagreements between uh, the Taliban and as well as Haqqani group, because uh, while Haqqani group is trying to have more control over the security sector, Taliban are somehow feeling that uh, that they, they are they are taught the Haqqani uh, is being supported right now more by the Pakistan than the Taliban. So it's one way or the other way, they are going to have all these uh, changes. So the way that the situation that we see right now is that uh, we had resistance so far in Panjshir, but you're going to see these pockets of resistance in different parts of the country, uh, especially with the way that Taliban are going with the depopulation atrocity of the people. I'm sure you heard about them um, uh, asking people from Daikundi province to, to evacuate the uh, several districts and go to other uh, provinces, and then they burn all their houses. So all these people, one way or the other way, they will go and they'll try to organize themselves and they will try to resist an uprise against the Taliban. Then we also having at the uh, uh, and beside all these uh, uh, um, uprising and resistance, so far the regional countries we think are keep quiet, but I don't think they are quiet. Uh, I think um, India has spent more than uh, $2 billion in Afghanistan reconstruction in the last 20 years. They're not going to easily let the situation go and let the Pakistan to ma manage everything and represent Afghanistan after this. I'm sure one way or the other way, countries like India, countries like Tajikistan, countries like Turkey and others, they are going to uh, support these uprising and resistance. And this itself, if not managed properly, is going to take us uh, to another uh, civil war. So, and then on top of that, we see that uh, the violations of human's rights and women's rights that Taliban are committing all around the country is also raising more uh, questions and more concerns all around the country because everybody in every platform is, is, is asking for not recognizing Taliban because they are not basically treating women as, as human beings anymore. So that is the situation. Governance for Taliban is going to be very difficult and it's not going to be easy. But then on top of that, if you look at the, uh, uh, the lessons learned, uh, perhaps when it comes to recommendation, I'll stop there because I can speak in the other round before, uh, because I think uh, otherwise it's going to be longer time. But if you look at the lessons learned, look, the structure that was imposed on Afghan people was never demanded by Afghan people, a very highly centralized structure. And on top of that, if you look at the ANSF, ANSF was structured in a, way, in a way that was highly centralized. Our governance was highly centralized and it could never respond to the situation that we had on the ground. And it was designed, designed by a group of uh, Afghan diaspora with international consultants. Uh, and then it was, it was mainly the, the international community. They were either working with Afghan diaspora or they were working with the warlords. And both of these groups had no intention of reconstructing the country, what we saw that. But then those people that they genuinely wanted to work in Afghanistan, they were engaging with them, but only to listen, but then do nothing and do not take any of the recommendation forward. The corruption was something that while every, everybody was talking generally in a different in platforms about it, but when it was coming, actually fighting the corruption, many, many times when I was in the government, I reported to the international community about the corruption that was going on in the system, but then I got no response and they said, we can't do anything about it. It's internal affairs of the Afghan people and Afghan government. We do not want to interfere. The impunity that we talked about, we saw that it brought to the people that people lost their motivation uh, fighting the Taliban. And on top of that, we are uh, forcing Taliban for inclusive government. But let's ask ourselves, did we have inclusive government before in the previous government? I don't think so. We especially didn't in the last seven years had no inclusive government. I mean, women were included and appointed like myself, youngsters were included, but it was all more like a symbolic to be there and fill the position and show to the world and the people. But we were not engaged in any discussion, strategic level and any decision making or in anything that had to do with the country's affairs. I want to stop it here and when it comes to recommendation, perhaps then in between the discussion, I can present my recommendation. Thank you. As promised, absolutely brutal. Thank you for that.
Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot there for Ab Abdullah to touch upon, some of which uh, we've had conversations about as well, which I think you'll, I, I would encourage you to follow up on and, and say the things that you wanna say. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, let me begin by thanking you. I actually did nothing. You have given me so much credit. It's, it's an honor to be in, in such a wonderful conversation today. I feel so much home because we have been studying in Kings and whenever we are talking in, in this platform, it gives you more motivation. Let me also take this opportunity and extend my appreciation and profound gratitude to the Peterson family I hope that they would be listening to us. Uh, I had it in my mind, regardless of understanding that they are here. I really hope that me and Najib both could contribute more to that noble cause uh, that uh, Alex would put in Afghanistan and that's on the shoulder of not us, but everyone in the country. Thank you so much uh, uh, to everyone, uh, as far as I know, her mother and maybe sisters listening to us. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I have divided my comment into three parts today. The first one, uh, if I may give some sort of analysis what's going on in Afghanistan at the moment. After the Taliban took over Kabul, I think Taliban is facing with new realities that they were not ready to confront so quickly at the moment. Uh, Taliban has been ruling and controlling part of the uh, rural areas and mountainous parts of the country in the past, uh, 20, if I may say, 18 years. And since the situation in the cities are much different. As you all know, let me remember, uh, remember everyone that there has been a big demographic changes in Afghanistan. 75% of the younger generations are below 40 at the moment, and they are located in the big cities like Kabul. Kabul is a city of uh, something between six to seven million. And other day, a friend of mine uh, conceptualized it. He told me that if Taliban would not be able to uh, manage it properly, Kabul is like a social atomic bomb that the Taliban is now lying on that. And uh, as you all know, this city has been also become so militarized in the past 20 years. People has the gun. And they have not forget how to use it. They have just put it aside for time being. So this is important to, to see uh, how Taliban going to be addressing three major questions, in my, in my opinion, and their relationship with the people. The first question is, what has been the end state of their fight in the past 20 years under the umbrella of so-called jihad, and how that's going to be turned now into the breads and on the table of the people? This is a question for the most of the people that, of course, military victory to, against uh, foreign forces might be something historically been uh, cherished by few in, in our history. But the more important question today is how that military victory is going to be turned into some sort of economic and social uh, success. Uh, the second key questions, because of the time I will I'll review on, on these questions, is some of the contradictions that the Taliban have been faced, has been faced, have been facing now at the moment. So uh, the, one of the key ideological question is that they have defeated, of course, the what they call it infidels, but now they are asking for the many of those taxpayers to be, to that the government could run at the moment. So how they're gonna be uh, ideologically quest, response to these questions, that would be also part of the ideological discourse among the hardliners in Kabul and beyond in Afghanistan. The, the third key question will be, I think most of the Afghans, the majority of the Afghans who are opposing ideologically the Taliban will be also asking for their liberties as we have been, we have, we have been witnessed that it has reflected in a different ways from demonstration to the, some sort of strikes in the city. And even I am so worried of some sort of what I call it an urban militancy and insurgency in the future. Uh, because the people are demanding not only for their liberty and freedoms, they need food, 
and the Taliban is not able to, to, to provide services. Services is important for the people in the cities, maybe not so much as it is for uh, the people in the rural area, but in the cities, the people are demanding. Taliban has not been able, for example, to issue these primary things such as passports in the past one and a half months, which is a high demand at the moment among the most of Afghans. The third question is also, I think, about the ability of the Taliban for governance and the potential uh, and the capacity that the international community may engage with them. Uh, the Taliban institutionally rejected any kind of cooperation, not only with the ex-official and the Afghan government, but they also have been so reluctant to give the chance for, for the people who have not been in the government in the past 20 years. So I think they have been dividing Afghanistan between them and others. And when it comes to the others, even they are not respecting to those brutal critics of the governments that I and Minister Nehan have been part of that for quite a bit of time. So it means that this kind of opposition with the majority of the people of Afghanistan might have some sort of reaction by the people in the future. And for example, I haven't seen that the Taliban would say, okay, so we'll not allow the ex-government officials to be in the government. Let's bring the character of the ex-government and give them a chance. While they are busy so much in distributing the resources and positions of powers as our government, as the government that we were partial to their loyals, which has been disastrous for us and now for the Taliban. So if I may uh, uh, conclude, these are the, 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 the key questions that the people are asking and we need to, to, to see how the Taliban are gonna be addressing this. In light of what Minister Nehon said, the, the rift among the Taliban is a serious issue. Since it's not a democratic uh, group uh, and pluralistic that the people could come out and talk about it, but it's so much. The people are competing with each other, the people are uh, trying to marginalize one each other in the Afghan government. As Minister Nahan said, the Kabul institutions has been captured by Akhanis mostly, and the Taliban and Doha, they are not, the, the political office is not happy uh, for that at all. Most of them or jobless as ourselves from like the ex um, uh, civil servant in Afghan government. Uh, there's also a fight between Ghiljai versus Burani's tribes within the Taliban. This also, there is another fight between who's going to be representing the, 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 the Taliban and the international community and who's going to be their big faces when it comes to uh, dealing with the things in Afghanistan because the Taliban have got now only one spokesperson that he's talking almost about everything. They need to, to respond to more complicated questions in a, in a common view weeks and coming months, not only to the domestic audience, but international community. I think these are important. I can go to, to different dimensions of this rift for hours in order to respect, I think that's needed to be deconstructed in another conversation. I really uh, suggest Professor that the Taliban who are and the mapping of the elites and how they are dealing with each other should be, should be subject of another conversation in the future. I think there is a lot of um, uh, ideas and, and new realities that need to be patched up. The, the last part that I would like to also uh, uh, touch upon very quickly is how the international, uh, the, the regional powers would, would deal with the, with the Taliban. Historically and traditionally, uh, the fight against the United States presence in Afghanistan has been a unifying factor. And I think that was the, the strategic objectives for most of the countries like China, Iran, Russia, to cooperate and support the Taliban. While that, that platform, that uh, reason and cause for cooperation has gone now because there is no US forces in Afghanistan and NATO forces in the country. Uh, there are three dilemmas when it comes to engaging with the Taliban by the regional powers. Firstly, I think the essence of the Taliban government and Islamic Emirates. Recognition and deeply engagement with a, with, a, with a purely Salafi, if I may say, or a traditional Islamic movement in Afghanistan would, would have a lot of political costs for, 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 for Central Asia, for China, and for Iran if they would easily accept such a reality even in Afghanistan. So it's not a matter of 
how to see regional powers relationship with the Taliban versus the West. It's also their own dilemma that they need to really address that. And that's why I think none of them has took the opportunity to come and front and say, okay, I will recognize a, a, an, an Islamic Emirate. Because the, the time that they would recognize an Islamic Emirate, that inspiration and that revelation will, will spread out across the region. And I think that would be like a strategic security threat for everyone. The second one is how the, United, the Taliban will be, will be positioning itself when it comes to their relationship with the United States and overall with the, with the liberal world. Because it's important, that has been our dilemma. When we have been in the government, we wanted to keep a check and balance between the region and the West, but it, it's sometimes impossible. If you become a client of a West, you need to prioritize some of the countries when it comes to the others. And I'm not sure whether Taliban will be able to keep that balance because that has been an inspiration among many leaders in the past in Afghanistan too, to find a way, but it's almost difficult and impossible to convince the uh, international community, especially the liberal um, countries to pay you while you are dating with Russia or with China or with Iran. It, it, it's impossible. And of course, the, the, the third key question is about the future of the regional countries allies and clients within the Afghan, within the Taliban government. I, I can give you an example of Iran, for example, to, to, to exemplify what I mean by this. So Iranians has been so uh, excited in order to support the Taliban in the, West, in the, in the south of Afghanistan and the West to, 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 to strengthen and, and, and increase their campaign against the Afghan government two months ago. And they had few clients and allies that they wanted to 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 to, to be support to, that has been the recipient, the key recipient of the Iranians' um, support in that. While when the government has formed those two key names that has been accused for a long time being Iranian allied and clients, Sadr Ibrahim, for example, and Zakir Qayyum, Taliban has given them a deputy ministerial position in the, in the Afghan government. And the, even the traditional allies of the Iran has not been accommodated, contrary to the bigger uh, agreement of the, the, the Taliban with the, with the regional countries before taking over the Kabul. And that's why you have seen that the Taliban, for example, the Iranian special advisor didn't uh, participate in a meeting of three other special advisors, Russian, Chinese, and, and Pakistani, who has visited recently Kabul. And you do see that this satisfactions would, would, would emerge and reflect in a different ways in the future. So, uh, and, and the last, I think, uh, recommendation, if I may say it in a one minute to, to respect the time, I think any kind of engagement, when we are talking about Afghanistan, we need to be very careful that we should not have a very simplistic and and minimalistic positions toward Afghanistan. We are talking about 35 million that are desperately waiting for some sort of humanitarian support by the international community. And I think we shouldn't be talk, we shouldn't be repeating the same mistakes that have been uh, continuously repeated, repeating itself in the past 20 years, that we should put the government as a center of our policy making and the, the local the way we look towards Afghanistan. I think the people should be center of any kind of decisions that either collectively or individual international community are gonna make. And we need to avoid also the risk of um, to find a safe way how we could avoid, how we could make the Taliban accountable for some of their promises and pledges. And of course, some of the responsibilities that they have as, as, as a group towards the international community, as a responsible member of the international community, and to give them assistance. We need to also be very mindful that a centralized system, as Minister Nehon said, could be a big doorkeeper uh, in the future, as it has been in the past 20 years. We have been, we have been lobbying for a decentralized government in the past 20 years, while simplistically most of the people would have 
told us that they all have an ethnic agenda towards this. While a portion of the collapse has been due to the centralized system of governance, a guy sitting controlling everything, when he left the country, everything has collapsed. So it's important that we should, lesson, we should learn these lessons. And I'm sorry, I think I was not academia. That's why I didn't respect fully uh, Dr. Cheng the time. I will, I will engage later on. Thank you once again, and I appreciate it. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So we've had lots of, of interesting comments and then many people have actually put in some great questions into the chat um, as well as into the Q&A. So uh, I'll ask my fellow panelists just to, to take a brief look at those. I'll, I'll go through them um, and we'll add people into the panelists. Christine, can yeah. I answer an anonymous uh, question for me? I just want to ask, it's anonymous. So this person yeah, yeah. doesn't want, so this, uh, someone asked about uh, the majority of Afghan people don't want the Taliban to be recognized internationally because of their barbaric and injustice behavior. Even though the Taliban received international funds, they would spend probably on weapons rather than supporting the people. Why does she push the topic that Taliban should be recognized internationally? I want to be very clear. That is not what I am suggesting. That is going to be the reality. There is, you have either you recognize or you don't. So as the governments, there's this huge push to recognize Taliban by a lot of regional organization. What Atal and I are trying to do is to say, okay, if that's where you're gonna go, here's the road ahead of you, and here's what you need to take into consideration. And here are what some of the things you need to be thinking about. This is not our role to say whether or not they should be recognized. However, if we don't put any conditions or if we don't think about the strategy, we will be repeating exactly what was mentioned by the three panelists, a failed policy for over 20 years, because then you are handing over the strategy to someone else. In the case of the Constitution, very typical of what the West has done, not only in Afghanistan, but also in Iraq, right? It was the diaspora in combination of uh, the West that created that. And so um, this is why we are warning um, um, for the sake of the Afghan population that is going to need assistance, uh, that's going to need the humanitarian assistance. How should we be thinking about the discussion with Taliban? So I just wanted to make it clear, I'm not pushing that. That's what's really being pushed for. So how do we think about it? Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak on that question about recognition? Because it seems to be a really big and important one. Uh, can I, Professor? I think it's even important uh, that how we're going to be framing or rewarding when it comes to engaging with the Taliban. Recognition, pragmatic engagement, I don't know, working, supporting, all of these workings has different meanings. And we really need to be very careful that nobody expolite and manipulate such a wording when it comes to dealing with, uh, with the Afghan situation, with Afghanistan situation, because it's super complicated. And that's why I think we needed like a deep thinking, how are we gonna be framing uh, our rhetoric towards the Taliban? Because this rhetoric is important, narratives are important, and this is where the policy is going to be built up on that. And, and that was my, my humble suggestion. I guess, please. Yeah. I mean, my point is that with the way that Taliban are dealing with the situation, and that shows very clearly that they don't know how to govern the country, how to deliver services, how to respect the basic rights of uh, human, how to deal with women as their equals. Um, and then all the issues at the regional level that they're having at the international level and domestically inside the country. So even if we engage with the Taliban, the point is that like how we do that to make sure that like Taliban understand that they have to accept the new Afghanistan. They have to accept that Afghanistan is a diverse society. They have to accept that citizens are equal. They cannot come and they try to rule everybody. They cannot come with their own version of uh, Islamic Emirate and expect everybody to follow and accept that. Uh, we had several discussion with Taliban during last um, 
one to two years. And we did confront them sometimes when they said Islamic Emirate, we say, and Sharia law, we say that, well, there are countries with, with implementation of Sharia law, but it's totally different than what you're telling us. So by the time that we managed to put enough of justification together to actually confront them and tell them that, you know, what Islam you're talking about, we haven't seen that model. There are also model of other countries. Then they said, they came and they said, oh, uh, a woman's right within Sharia law and Afghan culture. So basically, whatever they think is not going to fit in Sharia law, they're just going to put that under Afghan culture. So, and then even when we talk to culture, Afghanistan is a very diverse uh, uh, country. What is culturally accepted in, for example, south of Afghanistan is totally unacceptable to the north of Afghanistan. And same thing goes in like uh, between south and west and different part of Afghanistan. So I think when it comes to dealing with the Taliban, constructively engaging with them, that is important because it's also going to provide us an opportunity for in like ending the violence and trying to come with a political settlement. But honestly speaking, with the way the Taliban have dealt with the situation, with the way that Pakistan is interfering and Taliban are not saying anything, letting Pakistan to be their spokesperson, not only in the international forums, but also inside the country, I am very much less optimistic about continuation of the Taliban government. I feel like if they continue like this, even if the international community would try to support them, would try to provide humanitarian support to state institution, the symbol of the fact is that they cannot run the country, they cannot run the states, and they're going to have a lot of problems domestically, regionally, internationally. And then they're going to have a lot of uprisings. So I don't see continuation of Taliban. So this is something that even if we engage with them, we should make sure that our engagement should not strengthen Taliban and what they are doing, but actually like make them realize to see the bigger picture. How much they're willing to see the bigger picture is a big question because they're, I, according to what we have seen so far, they're not willing to do that. Najib, did you want to say anything to all of that? It's, it's a very difficult question. Um, well, it's because, um, well, the, the very reality of the Taliban is not very compatible with the, you know, with the realities and ideals of the 21st century. So um, I, if we subject Afghan people to such a group, um, I, I think it's going to be absolute betrayal. But anyways, uh, on the other hand, we um, do understand, you know, the dire condition of the people. So um, um, I, now that we have this disaster, this crisis in Afghanistan, we have to find a way to help the people um, there in Afghanistan. And um, well, that's one aspect. The other aspect is, which is more um, um, br uh, brutal, it's the kind of pragmatic approach, you know, that the world powers might have. So let's say if China, you know, goes about recognizing the Taliban, I think it will change the equation to a large extent in the you know, global stage. So um, obviously the Western powers, particularly the United States, does not want to be left out or does not want to be put in a situation where it loses out in Afghanistan. So that might uh, change you know, the, um, the, the equation with regards to the dynamics, with regards to recognizing the Taliban. Again, we have to wait and see how things evolve. It's interesting that all of you would want to tackle this particular subject in light of the fact that the G20 is going to meet right after the UN General Assembly to talk specifically about Afghanistan. So. Um, I was kind of try, trying to get you to the point where you'd say, if you could address the G20, what would you have to say to them? You can you can think about, you know, in in some of in tackling some of these other questions, um, what that might look like. I want to try. Uh, I don't know if if Danny, our uh, communications officer, might be online, but I was going. I was trying to add people as panelists so they could actually ask the questions themselves. But unfortunately, I don't have co-hosting privileges. So, Danny, I'm hoping either you can do that or you can add me as a co-host. Um, if you. Hi, I'm Christine. Um, I'll add yeah. you as a co-host. So, if um, anyone wants to ask a question, if they just raise their hand, and then we can unmute you and allow you to speak. Yeah, that would be great. So, I will. 
as soon as I'm able to, aha, yes, terrific. I think I'm able to do that now. Um, oh, no, not just yet. So let me start with the first, I'll start with um, a couple of questions in the chat while I'm being added as, ah, here we go. So I'm gonna start with adding Lukash, uh, who I see has asked a question in the chat. And so Lukash, you'll be promoted to panelist in, in just a second and you can turn on your camera and, and ask your question. Hi, um, thank you so much for your input and uh, for the very interesting discussion. My question is re with regards to the different militias that have been operating on behalf of different power brokers. If it was Dostum, if it was the former governor Atta, what happened to those groups and do you believe that they're going to come back in the upcoming months, going to mobilize and then going to start fighting again against uh, the Taliban? Thank you. So I don't know who wants to take that one. Maybe Abdullah, maybe Fatin, I'm not sure. who. I mean, whoever feels most able to tackle that and is is willing to tackle that, um, I will leave that. I, saw, I think Professor Fatin will go. Sorry, what, what, what was that? He, I think he said I should go, uh, but I just want to clarify. <laughs> are you asking what happened to these and are they going to be mobilized? Is that what the question was? Both. Yeah. I was really surprised that there was basically almost no opposition. Mazar fell very easily. Oh. And uh, I, as far as I, I used to live in Mazar, so I believe there are quite a few fighters who could actually be fighting Taliban. In the so, so there was a really interesting... Um, um, Exposo that was done talking to former um, Afghan military uh, Afghan military folks, and they talked about how they were losing because slowly they lost uh, um, support from the air, and so how that then shifted what they were able to do and not to do, and they became sitting ducks. And so when you're put in that situation where anything i mean you cannot win there it was no once us withdrew all of its different tactical and strategic support then it was almost impossible for some of these isolated places to be able to launch at the level uh, that they would need to win one two Taliban did not win by itself. Taliban had like 10,000 network of alliances with Al Qaeda and other groups and um, winning, going there and kind of like been doing threats over months. Again, this was not overnight. Um, these things were happening, but they were out of our sight. So unless you were living there, unless you were living it, you were not realizing what was happening. Uh, again, look at the death tolls. Look at how many attacks that even just uh, ISIS-K was doing the lead up to the withdrawal. It wasn't getting our attention at that time because it was not hot news in, in the West. So I think it is, it is um, um, it's not that there was no resistance. There has been a resistance since February 29, 2020, when uh, uh, President Trump negotiated the agreement um, and when we left out the government of Afghanistan. Why should anybody respect the government of Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, when we, the United States, left them out of the negotiations. And so we set the stage. And, the, and when we did that, the military was like, well, where are we going to win? How are we going to win? And so so there's there's a really good, I can't remember if it was New York Times, what they did, there's huge, just, just talking to military, uh, uh, Afghan military. Another thing is, let's not forget, over the 20 years, over 70, 77,000 Afghan police officers and military gave their lives. So this whole idea that they didn't want to fight for their country, I think it's a false dichotomy again in the West. So we have to be very careful. Um, there was some resistance. They were just not as strong uh, and enough. And that's why I think we will see, as um, Sir Kanjani and I have been saying, you're going to see some reshuffling and there might be a comeback. And also um, Minister Nihan and um, Mr. Sharifi were talking about, we don't, we're not gonna say it's tomorrow, right? But all the conditions seem to be lining up for something uh, to happen. Well, can I add something, Professor, uh, if you allow me? Uh, reorganization uh, takes a little bit of time. It would not happen within a night. Taliban being defeated in October, 2001, and they reorganized politically in 2004 and militarily even later on, like as a group, not as an individual, I'm talking so general, I'm not talking so specifically on the attacks that has been recorded later on. So it means that we have been talking of something between, between two to three years at least. 
while a political mobilization against the Taliban has been as quick as next day of the takeover of the Kabul by the, uh, specifically in the social media, you have seen millions of people that are opposing. And I think that has also created a fertile ground for those people who are inside Afghanistan to be saying. The second point, Afghanistan, sadly, what I have learned from Professor Cheng and the rest, is a fertile ground for such an insurgency, and it has been due to different causes and factors. Poverty, I don't know, grievances, uh, um, access to resources and access to a position of power. I can name 10 other factors, and of course, an international regional support for that. We have seen recently the Taliban is publicly confronting at least with two countries. One is with Tajikistan that they have uh, publicly uh, denounced and condemned their interferences, what they call their inter interferences in Afghan situation. And secondly, yesterday, Taliban put a, uh, also a public statement to condemn the violation of the air space of Afghanistan by the Americans. So it means that the Taliban is, has already started their confrontations in the region and beyond. I have heard the same story about their dissatisfactions deeply with the Iranians over some of the things. As we all know that Russians are also having a multi approach in, towards Afghanistan. It's not about that they have just recognized it and simply say, okay, it's done, let's, let's move on pragmatically with the, with, with the uh, Taliban takeover in Afghanistan. I think few coming months would be very critical, very critical for the international community, for the people of Afghanistan and for the Taliban. There are many scenarios from a civil war to a, a brutal, a stable country and to a power state. And there are other gray areas that we could explore later on on that too. Thank you, Professor. No, absolutely. No, I guess you wanted to say something. And then after that, I'm going to actually try and take three or four of the questions at once and then ask you each maybe to answer one, one or two of them, okay? I guess. Thank you. I'll keep it very um, um, uh, short because most of the points were already answered, especially by Dean and Johnny. I think it's very unfair that we blame the ANSF uh, for not fighting. They fought, uh, especially in the last few years when they were going to the battlefield. Literally, they knew that they're not going to come alive, but still they were going to the battlefield. It was the highly centralized system, the corruption, the racism and the impunity that actually let them down. And then there was also a lack of proper communication with them. I talked to some of the generals uh, in the past few days and I said, can you tell me what happened? It was not only the NSF, but also all of us that we work in the civil society, government everywhere. There was a lot of assumptions, but not lack of, uh, and, and then lack of clarity. For example, one thing that everybody was saying that, oh, there is an agreement between the US and the Taliban that 15 provinces will be taken by the Taliban so that they can, they are brought up at the same level with the government and then the negotiation will start. So in most cases, we don't know who, but somebody communicated from Kabul to these uh, uh, ADSF and told them that it's better that you peacefully gave in the province because soon we are going to have the political settlement with the Taliban and you're going to go back to your province, you're going to go back to your job and there's going to be amnesty. So most of them, they didn't fight with that impression that there somebody gave them that instruction. We don't know who gave that instruction. We need to find that information, but it was miscommunicated. By the time that most of them were given and then that process started, it was too difficult to manage the situation after 15 to 16 provinces because everybody started the process. And then a lot of deal also happened between many of the uh, local commanders and the Taliban. Uh, and then the other thing that happened that 
the previous government appointed most of the uh, one ethnicity in all around the country, because according to them, that's how they were thinking that they can control everything, not knowing that Taliban are also coming from the same ethnicity. So in many, many places, they literally did not allow the, the, uh, the, the soldiers to fight with the Taliban because they already had some sort of deal ethnically with those uh, 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 Taliban. So we need to have that information before uh, blaming those people that they sacrificed, as you said, more than 70,000 for the liberty of Afghanistan. So a lot has happened in the system that we need to get more information about how the, the resistance, it takes time, it will take time, but sooner or later, you will see a very strong resistance against the Taliban shape, uh, taking shape and form inside the country. And there are going to be countries that they will support them and they have their own reasons for doing that. And I think that part was touched upon very well by uh, the Mr. Fanjoni, so I don't want to go there. Thanks very much. Um, I popped into the chat for those of you who are interested, a really interesting podcast from um, an Afghan Brigadier General. So this is, and some of you actually on the panel might know him. So this is Brigadier General Koshat Sadat, who was the former Afghan Deputy Minister for Security. Uh, and he, he, he went through a pretty brutal interview. So this was posted yesterday and he, he talked about why he left and, and what had happened and why he didn't have faith and it was no longer willing to fight for for the government um, and how he felt about what happened when when the president basically fled so I would encourage you all just to have a, have a listen to that it's I think it's revelatory and it's a, in its own way um, I'm going Christine, to I was just going to say I just put in the article with the interview with the Afghanistan security forces it was in Washington Post in the chat as well so for anyone interested to take a look at their perspective from on the ground what was happening Great, so those resources are there in the chat. Um, I'm going to ask Payal uh, to unmute herself. Oh, is she, she, oh, there she is. Payal, um, could you unmute yourself and then you can turn on your camera if you want and, and ask your question, introduce yourself too. Um, and then I'm going to ask Thomas to do the same. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you so much for this session. Uh, I am Payal Satsena from India, and I was a student of uh, conflict security and development in 2012. Um, I'm currently working on a maternal healthcare project in Afghanistan, and I'm constantly in touch with the midwives, the doctors and the supervisors that we are training. And uh, it is actually surprising that despite everything, they're still going about their work and they're going, uh, you know, they're going from house to house to take care and to give medical assistance to expectant mothers and children. But what they're scared of is the, the, the drying up of funds in the Ministry of Public Health. As of now, they what they tell me is that the, the Taliban soldiers are not really stopping them from doing their work, but they are really worried about the drying of funds. So I would like uh, either Mr. Abdullah or anyone like to answer this question as to what do they uh, foresee about the funds, especially in the Ministry of Public Health, because no country can really go forward if the health sector is totally, uh, you know, in, in shambles. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Thomas, if you could introduce yourself and, and ask your question, and if it's helpful, um, you can direct it at one of the speakers. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Thomas McGuire. Thank you very much all. Uh, visiting fellow uh, in the Department of War Studies uh, and an assistant professor uh, of intelligence and security at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And uh, I'm very interested in um, the impact that political change has on uh, security sectors in a number of countries, including Afghanistan. And so my question is, uh, how much change or continuity are we seeing in in uh, the security sector of, of Afghanistan right now, both in terms of institutions and, and personnel. Um, are we seeing generally um, a quite significant uh, cleansing and change uh, in um, the role of these institutions and the, their personnel from the leadership down to um, the, the rank and file, or are we seeing um, more in the way of co-optation of these uh, institutions? Thank you very much. And let me throw one more in the mix here from Florence Mayo, who I think has since left the seminar, but but put it put in an interesting question into the chat here, which is um, to all of you, do you think that a consociationalist model would work for governance in Afghanistan? So thinking about Lebanon specifically, you know, that's probably the one that, that most of us would immediately associate with uh, 
consociation, consociationalism, uh, which is having different elites from either different ethnic groups or different religious groups share power, but in a very explicit kind of way. You, know, you get the presidency one year and then you rotate around, you get these ministries or you know, one third of parliament goes to these groups and then another third goes to these groups and so on and so forth. So would something like that kind of a government um, work, do you think? Is there, is it a possibility uh, if, you know, going forward, there was to be a different kind of settlement? So I'll leave that open to all of you. Um, I'll leave you also to answer the questions that, that you feel like answering. And maybe, uh, maybe we can stop, start with Najib, if that's okay. Thank you, Professor. Um, well, I'll, I'll go to the first question. Uh, health ministry. Um, well, it's very um, moving, you know, to see that uh, those um, the health workers are still doing their job, you know, despite the fact that they haven't been paid, um, you know, their wages, and um, they're facing very, um, very tremendous and very intense economical crises. Um, it's because um, it's not just them. Um, Actually, the whole country is facing such a crisis right now. But um, I don't believe, you know, we have a lot of money in the uh, Ministry of Health. Um, I, um, you know, believe the entire government, there is no money there. And um, as we discussed earlier, the Afghanistan resources have been frozen by the United States. So um, the biggest impact of that has been on the people. Um, um, so uh, unless and until that's resolved, you know, I, I don't think the issue of wages will be, you know, resolved. And um, I don't know when these uh, health workers will stop working, but I don't, I hope they don't. Um, as for the security se sectors, um, security sectors in Afghanistan, the security institutions have been, um, the um, Taliban have, um, assumed positions both in the strategic and the operational and to a large extent in the tactical level as well. Um, the um, issue is that uh, the Taliban don't trust those who worked in the security sector in the former British uh, government uh, because they see them as their enemies and um, they have also engaged in extensive uh, um, you know, retribution, uh, particularly against, you know, those who worked for NDS, National Director of, of Security, which is Afghanistan's intelligence organization. Um, so um, it will be, um, I believe, you know, a large scale cleansing of these organizations because Taliban already feel very insecure, you know. We discussed this earlier that um, they fear that an uprising could take place at any moment in any part of the country, particularly from Kabul. So that's why they have been very, very um, careful and at the same time, very fearful as well that, um, and there, there, there were even reports, you know, that in certain areas where there were um, large population of uh, people from, from Panjshir and from, from Shamali Plain, you know, that uh, some of the youngsters were just picked up by the Taliban for no reason and put in jail, mainly because of their fear of, of them uprising against them. Um, so um, um, I think this will continue and the security institutions will be totally cleansed. All righty. Um, I'm so sorry. Do you want to follow um, up on that button? I was going to have talk about the consociational um, uh, one, just because I think it's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I really think there needs to be a discussion about what form of, of government and not a centralized the, uh, form. And consociation comes to mind uh, in post-conflict, especially in ethnic, uh, multi-ethnic uh, communities. I would say Lebanon horribly applied it. And I think if you ask Aaron Libhart, there's a couple of years he would consider Lebanon as fully a consociational uh, democracy and not every time. And that is because there's a series of conditions that must be met. Yet too often when we go to apply it in post-conflict states, we only focus on um, 
elite cooperation and uh, the uh, mutual veto. We forget everything else that is necessary in order for constitutional democracy to work. I think it is an option. Um, I just put in the chat, um, there was a new a special issue uh, in 2019. Um, and so I, I just put in the, the introduction, which goes through the articles and the summary. And you know, you've got countries like Lebanon, but you also got like, you know, the most famous one I'd say would be Switzerland, right? Um, and others. And so I think if anybody's interested to take a look at that, the, the pros and the cons, uh, because if Afghanistan is going to move forward in that form, I would say learn from the mistakes of Lebanon and not do it the way Lebanon did, because I mean, Today, Lebanon is in com complete collapse, um, where um, about, according to World Bank, more than 60% of the population, 55 to 60% of the population is below the poverty line, have no food, no access to uh, electricity and uh, water. It is um, in complete shambles. Um, and uh, uh, and so, so don't follow Lebanon's model because they did not do it properly. And with respect to security sector, I have not seen e enough. All I've seen is that, uh, so I don't know details on the ground. Others can say that. But what I've seen so far is that um, Taliban has allowed their own groups to govern differently in different areas. And so I don't think yet it is what we would consider an institutional um, reform um, in, the, in the way um, or co-opting it in the way typically we would think about it. Uh, when you go in, they have their own people, their own fighters, and it's been more of a takeover um, in a lot of places. But I think if you go on the ground, you may find a, a, a lot of variance among the different um, uh, districts and um, inside of Afghanistan, but I don't have the, too much knowledge on the ground. I guess, did you want to, to come in? On the health sector, the structure that we had was the, uh, there were NGOs uh, that they were providing basic services, uh, um, uh, health packages to uh, the citizen, and they were being uh, contracted by Ministry of Public Health. So Ministry of Public Health was um, dealing mainly with big hospitals in the center of the uh, several big provinces, but not money. Uh, because we had limited number of uh, public hospitals that they were managing. But in terms of providing basic services to the citizen, it was all done by NGOs. So one of the models that, uh, and then uh, the funding was mainly coming to uh, World Bank through a Council Reconstruction Trust Fund. And then they were providing that money to the Ministry of Public Health to just contract uh, the NGOs and they were providing the services and they were just doing the monitoring uh, and uh, reporting. So I think in case of that, um, uh, perhaps the World Bank uh, can come together with WFP and they can look into that model that they, in the, they can minimize the engagement of the government, but they maintain uh, those that structure in place so that those angels can provide continue uh, continue providing support to the people and they can get paid according to their contracts that they have. But it's going to be less engagement of Ministry of Public Health because Ministry of Public Health will actually will be more a problem creator at this stage rather than supporter. Uh, so I think that is something that uh, we need to, I'm sure that the World Bank is already looking into that possibility, especially that they can't work with the current government. But I think there has to be more push for that. Uh, yes, humanitarian support is something that we desperately needed, especially that now soon we're going to have um, uh, winter starting in Afghanistan. So many of the families will also not have fuel and food during cold uh, weather of winter. But I think it's also important that uh, UN comes up with a modality that they reduce their admin costs because if they charge the admin cost of up to 30%, 300 million of the 1 billion that uh, the countries promised and pledged uh, uh, for providing humanitarian support uh, will once again go to the admin cost of UN. And I think for a good country like Afghanistan, going to the crisis right now, it's a lot of money. Uh, and in terms of uh, security sector, uh, the institutions are uh, totally uh, are there, but the people have totally disappeared, I mean, mainly because of the fear of uh, prosecution by the Taliban, killing and torture. Uh, but we hope that at some point when we work on the, and, and this has happened previously as well, that we did have an army during uh, before the civil war. So it disappeared, everything collapsed. But as soon as we had the interim government uh, in 2002, most 
most of these generals and soldiers, they came back with some sort of record and they wanted to join back uh, the army. And some of those people were hired and some of them were not hired. So I think the people are there, the army and NSF are there. Yes, they are in hiding. But as soon as we put some sort of structure that will secure their life and will give them the assurance that they're not going to be killed or prosecuted, uh, they are going to come back. And I, but I think what is really important that we really look into structure that given the, 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 the location that Afghanistan has and given the challenges that we have in terms of ISIS, Talib, or any other group or the, uh, that will, you never know that you know, the new name will come and will pop out with the same strategy and same funder, we need to come up with a structure for NSF that will respond to the to the ground realities and the challenges that we have, rather than just few generals in like and thinking that this is what Afghanistan should have. We need to see like what Afghanistan can have. I always give a very in like a basic example when I talk to few people, like even before collapse of the administration, I said our NSF is just like a big elephant. And the proxy war that we have in Afghanistan in the name of Taliban, Haqqani, ISIS, and others, these are just the little mouses that suddenly get, they get into the house. So how do you expect that big elephant to respond to a big number of uh, uh, mouses that they suddenly get into one room and all of them are trying to attack the elephants one from one way from the other way? That has been the reality of our aim. Highly costly, like high structure, highly centralized, but not being able to respond to the realities and the needs that we have in Afghanistan. So I think that is something that like will give us more time that we need, really look, need to look into that and see that you know, like what do we have, what, what Afghanistan, what what's, what are the requirements in Afghanistan? But of course that can happen only if we have a part if you have a partner in Afghanistan. Right now there is no partner in Afghanistan, and uh, as mentioned earlier. Taliban is not willing to cooperate with anybody. They don't, they are not willing to recruit anyone, even within their own team. They have a lot of players and they 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 don't easily trust anybody, they don't bring them on board. It's actually like a lot of trust building that they need to do among themselves first, then with others. That's a very interesting point. Maybe Abdullah, you want to pick up on that? I mean, we've been talking about that, the the divides within the Taliban. Uh, and the difficulty and where that might go in terms of the security situation. Um, as long as also there were all of those other questions that, that you might have wanted us to, to speak to as well. So Abdullah, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor. I think Taliban has committed two very strategic premature uh, mistakes at the beginning days. First of all was right taking over the Kabul without coordination, without having a proper plan, and without even communicating this properly among themselves, like among the different groups of the Taliban. And secondly, prematurely announcing an Islamic Emirate, that retreating from such a model now put them in a very tough situation. And this, I think it also included Another complementary mistakes, if I may say, that they have they have brought their key pounds, the core, the, the the prominent people, right away into the positions. That now removing any of them would be would have a lot of political consequences. Let me elaborate a little bit into that. I mean, uh, the Taliban uh, have been divided mainly. Generally, I am talking into three groups. A political group sitting in Doha, they were dating international community, entertaining everyone based on their ethnicities and the countries they were coming. Sometimes they were very liberal when it comes to talking with Europeans. They have been confronting the US and they have been so rash when it so harsh when it comes to the Afghans. So they had the ability of communicating with the different wordings and exploiting different narratives within the system of reality of each individual of us in the past two years. The second group was the military wings within Afghanistan, a group backed by uh, Pakistan, mainly the Haqqanis. Uh, the second group uh, in the middle, uh, which was represented by Mullah Yaqub, the son of uh, Mullah Omar, and the ex express leader of the Taliban, and the third one, the people like Zakir Qayyum uh, and these kind of people do, that have been going 
between Pakistan and Iran and Russia and uh, maybe the other countries. Uh, at the first night of Kabul, that was the Haqqanis who entered the Kabul because of their proximity to Pakistan. It took only four hours for them to get into, while the people sitting in Doha, it took three days for them to come to Kandahar, my brother. And the people in the south of Afghanistan, Helmand and Kandahar, uh, Zakir al Qayyum and uh, Ibrahim al Sadr, it took one day for them. And the people coming from the north, for example, the ch chief of army staff, uh, now Fasihuddin, it took at least one day for him to come over from the north to Kabul. And that has been the same case when uh, the, 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 the government of Mujahideen took over when the Taliban left Kabul. That was predominantly people from Panjshir and Parwan because of an hour proximity to Kabul, they came and captured the institutions there. Capturing an institution is the easiest thing you could do in Afghanistan, but when it comes to responding to institutional demands, this is where the dissatisfactions and conflicts generates itself. And Taliban is facing at the moment the same problem. Which institution, who should have control on that? and they don't know how to do it. And we also should be mindful of another fact that violence and insurgency has been a unifying factor, a factor for cooperation and assistance historically. But being inside the government, that has been also a saddest part of the history in, Af history in Afghanistan that, that, that divide the people. It becomes so divisive and that's where the Taliban is facing at the moment. And of course, now, if you put this into the context of the uh, pattern and client relationship of the Taliban's within the region and beyond, then it will, it will add extra uh, complexity to the, to the conflict. To, uh, to the public health, uh, to the pile questions about the public health, my suggestion is, that we need to make sure that Taliban should not politicize some of the sectors, specifically the public health sector. According to the constitution or previous constitution in Afghanistan, public health was free and it was covering every citizen regardless of their political opinion and political ideology. And I think the Taliban should follow the same rationale and the same logic at the moment because they have been benefiting from our public services that the international community providing them in the past 20 years in Afghanistan. And I think that's one of the areas that the international community must not leave to that the, that the, and that the uh, money should dry up. I just learned from the uh, uh, Professor Gott, uh, Fatten, uh, 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 PowerPoint that it needs only 38 million, if I'm in primary right, for WHO to cover four coming months on that area. That's, that's, I think, like a peanuts. It's not a big money at all. Uh, when it comes to uh, con social, uh, a deconstructed, if we may say, because some of the wording is also in Afghanistan, Balkanization, Lebanon, Lebanonization, I don't know, this kind of stuff is so controversial in Afghanistan. I think the key question at the moment is what, a, what kind of modality could bring people's participation in the, into the state and provide an opportunity for the people to cooperate with the state? to bring legitimacy and in the meantime it's important to see how the people could see themselves within the system. I am so sorry to say this that I am so much against this inclusivity which is totally a western phenomenon and has never been the case in Afghanistan too in the past 20 years too. I have been myself in the Afghan government. We have just misused and exploited exclusivities. I mean, Taliban is even naive. If I would have been the Taliban, I would have brought two madrasa, I don't know, students from Peshawar, and I would tell to the people, okay, if you want the woman to be participated, let's see, let, let, they are, these are two women representing, representing the woman in our, in our system. I think exclusivity is a very, very Western phenomenon, which never has been 
deconstructed properly in Afghanistan. And I think people participation is important and people participation should not be should not be limited to the participation of a group of elites within the government. I have never, I mean, I have been in a ministerial positions, I guess Nahon, Minister Nahon was there, and we, ne we never claim that we have been purely representing the people because the people didn't appoint us. We have been appointed because of our political affiliation with a specific power holders within the system. And that's where I think it's important to be mindful of. Just last point about security in the institution. I think it's for the Taliban to think about the size of the new uh, security forces in Afghanistan. The previous size, the previous structure was totally dealing with a different situation. Today, we are in a different environment. We are in a different. And this is where the Taliban is facing the biggest challenge, that is how to transform from a young insurgency into an institutionalized disciplined forces. We have been listening to the Taliban leadership in the past one and a half months now that they have never even controlled properly and enough on their soldiers in Kabul while they are doing. I'm sure you have heard that mostly they have ordered their people to do not violate some of the principles, but they are doing it on the daily basis. And it means that that cohesion, lack of cohesion, and that would be another challenge even in the coming few weeks. If I would be a fighter of the Taliban for the sake of conversation, the key question, the key incentive for me is still to be there that I could see some sort of benefit for me. The time that I would not see that benefit, I will easily turn, I would easily change my flag from white to, I don't know, to red or to green or to black. It's just a matter of uh, less than a meter uh, cloth to find it from somewhere and just claim legitimacy in Afghanistan. Thank you, Professor, once again. All right, I've got a few more questions here. Um, and I would just, if you've got several questions, I would ask you to limit them, limit your questions to just one, if that would be possible. So I've got Mara Khan, I've got Banu, I've got Mia, and I've got a couple of questions from people who have uh, since left the seminar, but I'll ask them for those of you who want to tackle them anyway. Um, so the first one here is from Kiara Janka. Uh, it says, thank you for these great presentations, which powers could currently have an interest in backing the resistance in Tajikistan and how likely is it that the political leaders, warlords and commanders, et cetera, can form a coherent resistance movement and rally behind the same goals. So I'll, I'll leave that open to those who might want to answer it. Um, there's a second one here from Iniolua, uh, and it says, what are the implications of the US and her allies declaring the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan as a pariah state, not at all engaging with that state, not to mention legitimizing that government for the conduct of international relations today in the COVID-19 era? So if, again, this is you know, going back to that issue of recognition and again, thinking about the G20 and what's going on right now in New York, um, something else to, to consider for those of you who want to answer those questions. So I'm going to ask uh, Mara Khan now to unmute himself and to ask his question. Mara Khan, are you there? I hope you're there. If not, I think we should call them based on this because Mr. Nawabi, you told that you're, I'm so sorry for maybe he might not. Hold he time. was just there. He just opened, briefly, maybe there's something problem with the internet because he was, he opened his uh, picture a couple minutes ago. Oh, really? Are you, mm -hmm. are you there by any chance? Okay, if you are, I'll come back to you. If not, I'll read out one of your questions in just a moment. So let me go to um, Banu Yanar. If you're there. Yeah, hello. Uh, I put the question as if it were possible to conduct a poll or survey among the people, what would be the uh, percentage of the population that would support Taliban governance? And now that sounded a bit Western and speculative. I'm just curious about the support of local people for Taliban. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Um, Mia, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, ask your question? Sure, thank you. So I'm. what I was curious about is we have a few instances where mil militant actors are able to hold territory, but the problem is we have a lot of instances where they fail and so they retreat and, and so they lose their, their place and their ability to rule. So part of what I was curious about is whether um, the panelists thought the Taliban would be able to maintain control of the territory, but also with a rising alternative threat because these tend not to be dyads, we tend to see multiple actors. And when we have multiple actors, you know, we have the possibility of, of a very complicated uh, scenario. Excellent. And now we have Mr. Nawabi. Would you like to ask your question? You have to unmute yourself. Oh, you just press the um, the mic button at the bottom of the screen, and then we'll be able to hear you. Yeah, it's okay now. Uh, hi to all members. Uh, hope you're all doing great. Uh, thanks for hosting such kind of conference regarding the Afghanistan. Uh, but as I am in, in, in Kabul currently, and uh, I know everything under my eyes, so the contemporary issue which is uh, which is concerning is that uh, most of the uh, female students they are deprived from the their schools from their studies so still the taliban don't have any clear plan and vision regarding that so uh, what do you think about this issue what will be the next uh, uh, steps of the taliban and what will be the international community uh, uh, interaction regarding this issue? Thank you so much. All right, so this is the final round. You can, I know there was a lot in there and you can, could take all day to answer all of these questions. Um, so please feel free to, to pick and choose. And um, let, me, let me start with Fatin to close out your remarks. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot to take in and to, to think about. I think you know some of the we tried to allude to some of the answers. For example, the resistant movements who would back it. I think you know Mr. Kanjani pointed exactly to an argument I've made before: the ideology of Taliban and the ideology, which is more what we'd consider a, a version uh, of radical Salafi ideology, um, uh, with the Diobandi uh, interpretation or addition to it, um, and the uh, the ideology of ISIS. K, which we would consider as a Takfiri ideology, are a threat to every surrounding uh, country in the region and um, uh, worries both Iran, worries Tajikistan, worries, um, you know, Indonesia and China. And so I think everybody's watching. And that is why right now you're not seeing much happening because they want to see what is going uh, on and then they'll make. So I think there might be enough people to support whatever depending on uh, what happens. With respect to this, this uh, idea about you know, this recognition versus engagement, I think it's extremely important, uh, again, um, as we've been talking about, I think we definitely should engage with the institutions. We should not leave the population, but that does not mean we have to recognize the government. Again, I think these are false dichotomies that we keep putting. Uh, recognizing a government is one thing, engaging through institutions in order to help individuals is something else. Western nations, one thing they can engage Age is giving money to the organizations that need them. As I mentioned, the WHO needs money. So to in order for the next four months, that's how they can engage by saying to the people of Afghanistan, we still see you, we still hear you um, versus Taliban uh, um, as, as a government, right? So I think we need to think about, again, about these things. Um, the other thing uh, about uh, control um, that uh, Mia was asking, I'm, I'm going to include a form. I muted myself, sorry. I'm including a foreign policy article um, about the Taliban can't control Afghanistan and they go through some of the issues. Uh, I don't think with time they'll be able to control, again, some things we've touched upon both because of their internal divisions between the fighters and between the commanders. And as Mr. Hanjani said, between the different wings of the of Taliban, I think people in the West have not really thought about this much about all these differences and what they may have. And let's not forget, ISIS-K is made out of 
Taliban, ex-Taliban military commanders who uh, defected and uh, joined there. And so I think they would be waiting in open arms for any Taliban fighter that is not um, happy. And so I think you're absolutely right. Uh, controlling uh, um, is different than being able to maintain it. And I don't think they're going to be able to maintain it with time. I can't give you timeline, but, but I think all the factors and indicators say they're going to have a hard time, especially now that they're more divided than they were when they were the Mujahideen back in the 1990s. Um, and for the last, the international community, I think, you know, I get a lot of these questions even from Lebanon, right, from a lot of these young activists and young students, what's the international community going to do, what's the international community going to do, and I mean, I think um, uh, Minister uh, Nihan, I think, said it, like, the international community always comes back with, I'm sorry, I can't do anything. And, and so as a, as a Lebanese, I, I have a different outlook maybe about the international community and their effectiveness than maybe a typical um, scholar uh, or individual. And I feel like they don't have, are not equipped to intervene in a way that has been as effective as we would like them to be. So they can make some noise, they can make some things. And that's why, and these organizations at the end of the day are made up of nations and states. And what are the states are going to be willing to do? And right now, I honestly don't see much involvement or willingness to be involved. And that's because there's a lot of fear in terms of they don't know what the future holds. They recognize and realize they've messed up in the last 20 years and no one wanted to talk about why. Um, we haven't even, we're not willing to even ask the questions lessons learned properly. I think we have done that engagement here on the panel. But let's be honest, within the scholarly community and the policymaking community in the West, they don't really want to hear much about that. Um, so I'll end there. I have a whole nother panel set for that lesson learned discussion, like a proper, proper discussion about that and some of the issues that, that Narcus has talked about earlier around corruption, which we have not tackled at all. Um, so many of the mistakes that, that I've spoken to um, Abdullah about in terms of the mistakes that were made, the kinds of things that we are complicit with um, I'm hoping to bring um, somebody from the Special Inspector General's Office for Afghanistan to come and have a talk with us about some of those revelations, not even revelations, those reports have been out for years. So we will have another conversation about that um, in the coming months, I hope. Um, let me pass the baton over to uh, maybe to, I don't know, uh, we'll go back in the order <laughs> to, to which we started. So how about Najib, why don't you... Um, why don't you offer us your some of your thoughts and any questions answers to those questions? You need to unmute. I always forget to unmute myself. So I'll be very quick because I have to rush to another meeting. Uh, so which governments will um, likely recognize the Taliban? Or no, sorry, um, will offer support to the resistance. Um, it's again too early to say that. Probably that I mean the Central Asian states, um, maybe Russia, and um, possibly Iran, you know, and India, obviously. Um, it's been a natural, um, you know, as I said earlier, India feels itself, you know, the biggest, feels defeated big time in Afghanistan. So um, these countries will most likely join forces and um, you know, support the resistance. Again, if the behavior of the Taliban does not change, I don't believe you know, that the behavior of the Taliban will change because at the end of the day, we shouldn't forget you know, that it's a highly ideological group you know, and um, ideological groups behavior is mostly informed you know, by the ideology itself rather than rational political thinking. Um, uh, you just announced the question about the U.S. announcing Afghanistan a prior state. Um, again, it's this is um, this is a question that uh, will be um, answered in the next coming weeks or months because, it, as you know, um, it was discussed earlier. I think everybody is the whole world is watching the Taliban to see how they will behave, you know. And uh, so far, their behavior has not been very promising. So um, I wouldn't say yes or I wouldn't say no. And a day, again, it depends on the large extent on the global and regional uh, political um, competitions, you know, particularly with the issue of China and India being into play. 
So that will determine the decision of the US. Uh, but what's extremely annoying to us and very disturbing to us as Afghans is that why the US and the Western you know, liberal world allow the Taliban to come and take power in the first place. That's the question that I have not been able to figure out an answer to, come up with an answer to. And with regards to the poll and survey, if I think if we do a poll tomorrow and it's fair and transparent, probably 90% of the people will say no. <laughs> because it's for, at the end of the day, Ideology is one aspect, you know, this is not the time after ideology, particularly for a country like Afghanistan where poverty is so pervasive. People need services, you know. I was, um, had a friend uh, who was a researcher and he was going to the Taliban control areas a lot. And um, he told me a story one day that um, the Taliban go to the villages, this was before the Taliban take over power, and they were, you know, mobilizing, gathering people and they were, you know, um, they were preaching people about like jihad, about you know violence, about like liberating the country and stuff. And then the elders would listen to them. The people, the communities would listen to them for like half an hour or an hour. And then when their you know um, speech ended, you know the elders would go to them and said that and to, would tell the Taliban that wonderful remarks, you know people. But at the same time, we also need a clinic here in this village. So what can you do about that? So we have to keep in mind this factor that at the end of the day, people's primary, primary, primary needs are basically survival rather than ideology. So um, this is uh, what I had and I have to profess and I have to leave, uh, jump to another meeting. So thank you so much for having me in this wonderful webinar and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for joining us. Um, goodbye, Najib, but I'm going to turn over to Nargis and then to Abdullah for the final remarks. So, Nargis. Thank you. Well, um, with regard to citizen support for the Taliban and also maintaining uh, power uh, for the Taliban, how difficult or easy it's going to be. Uh, look, last time when Taliban took power, we had civil war in Afghanistan. Basically, on a daily basis, women were getting kidnapped. They are being raped, they are being killed, men and women, and it was not a secure country at all. So Taliban came and they took Afghanistan, at least they brought rule of law. That was the least thing. I mean, how fair it was, uh, that's another thing. But at least there was rule of law, there was a government, the civil war started, at least people physically uh, were secure if the government was not after them. But what happened after a few years? As soon as they brought the security, people were asking for uh, their uh, voice. The people were asking for food. They were asking for shelter. Uh, they were asking for employment. That Taliban was not able to provide them with any of them. So what happened that you saw that slowly and gradually resistance began to take shape from different in different parts of the country against the Taliban. And uh, by the time uh, that 9-11 uh, happened, there was already a well and robust uh, resistance against the Taliban uh, inside the country. So imagine at that time they came and they stopped the civil war, but still there was resistance against them and people were supporting the resistance. This time they came and literally they destroyed everything that we have built in the last 20 years. So it's not going to be easily accepted by, by the people. And there is no way that people will give in to what Taliban are trying to do. So you will see that I'm very optimistic that resistance is going to take uh, shape far much more quicker than before. And um, yes, it will also depend uh, partly on uh, how much support uh, the resistance can get from different countries. Because right now, somehow, except one or two countries, other countries are just waiting and watching to see the situation and they make their difference. But also Afghanistan is a rich country. So, I mean, Taliban, uh, even they cannot control their own soldiers. They cannot control uh, uh, Kabul. So there's no way that they will have full control over all 34 provinces. That means that the same activities that Taliban were having, the, the resistance will start to have. They are going to uh, imply their own taxes on the people. They are going to extract their own mines and they're going to export them. And they like smuggling, like drugs, name money, think that will, they will be able to uh, generate revenue and then will be, be able to continue, continue their, their fight. So we are exactly where we were in 2002. The only difference is that at that time we had the international community and a newly formed government in Kabul and Taliban in the mountain. This time we have 
have Taliban on its own in the palace and we're having other people in resistance in the mountain and also a good number of uh, uh, Afghans uh, that they are outside the country. They are they are using all their voice, civic voice, trying to raise and question and uh, criticize the process and present recommendation. So I think all this together would be too much for Taliban to 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 manage, especially that they could not deliver on the very basic promises that they made to the people. They literally lied to everybody. They said that we are we have changed, we have become moderated, we are going to govern Afghanistan differently, but we saw that that didn't happen. So and no one can trust Taliban anymore. No one can trust the supporters of Taliban anymore. And, uh, and the point is that everybody will look into action. And the action, when you look at the Taliban, what they are doing, you see that they haven't changed a lot at all. They have become much more brutal uh, even than before. So you will see that resistance is going to be there. The other good example that we have is the women uprising. I remember so many times when we were talking about women's rights Taliban, when the whole peace process started, everybody was blaming us that, oh, you're a small number of women elites in Kabul. What you're asking is only like for yourself and a small group of you. I mean, women in the ruler of Afghanistan, other women, they don't seem like they don't listen, they, they don't agree with you, and they're not asking for the rights that you're fighting. And I, the, the wife of Ambassador Khalilzad, he, she even wrote an article on all of us criticizing us that your fire, your right is your own fight. It's not us. We don't expect us to fight it for you. But look what happened. Most of those women, they were, I talked to them, they said that we got so frustrated that suddenly Taliban came. We were set at home. We lost our job. We had to feed our family members beside ourselves. We had no income and we didn't know about our future. So they said, wait them one day, two, three, Finally, after two days, they blasted. They said, we went out. We said, even if they kill us, we have to raise our voice and we have to tell them that we want to get back to work. So remember, you know, these people, it's not about you know, like rights that you know, it's about say, something. It's about very basic rights that without them, they cannot live. A woman who, is the, who has seven members of the family dependent on her because she has lost her husband or father or there is no male uh, member in the family, how do, what do you expect her to do now? So sooner or later, she is going to come out, not for those rights to make a decision to travel, but the, for the rights to work and to be able to feed her family. So I think with the way that they are governing and with the way that they're ruling, uh, this itself is going to strengthen the resistance against them. This itself is going to create more uprising against them. The point is that how do we manage the situation to make sure that Afghanistan is not moving ahead to another catastrophe? Because it, this, it's also if not managed properly, will take Afghanistan to another civil war. So because Taliban, remember one thing, that besides being a uh, highly ideological group, they are also criminals. They are also very much an ethnocentric group that end of the day, we saw what they did in Panchen, we saw what they did in Daikundi. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we need to move ahead, but 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 I want, if you ask me, I don't think Tal Taliban took power because the power was basically given to them. They didn't take it. And now maintaining that, there's no way that they can do that. All right. So uh, you get the final word on on all of this and setting the future of Afghanistan for um, what you want it to be, what you hope it can be. Professor, I see from your face, I read it that you did a wonderful job and you are so exhausted. I'll just finish this conversation with just one paragraph that I would like to really lobby for that. International community has a political and moral responsibility towards the people of Afghanistan. They have every right to criticize and blame either the ruling elites, including myself or themselves. But at the end of the day, we need to be mindful that 13 million people, if they could not find food, shelter, and these basics, lives, needs, they will die. And according to the many accounts, we are talking about 18 million people that if they would not receive within a few weeks assistance, they would be facing with a danger to their life. And I really hope that international debate would shift from blaming each other. I have been doing it myself. I am crazily frustrated and 
infuriated on myself, on my colleague in the peace structure, and on the president and the circle. But it's not a strategy. And I have seen that the same mistake is repeating itself in Washington. Last night, the chief of staff for me and the um, defense minister was in the Congress blaming each other. And now this blame has gone to another level, to the, to the, to the presidential level. I think this is not a strategy. And thanks to you that you are putting this very critical questions in front of all of us. What's the future and how we could reach out to the people? And that's where I think I would very briefly touch upon the topic of recognition versus engagement. I think we don't need to engage only with the institution and Taliban. We need to engage with the people of Afghanistan. That's totally different thing. Through a third party, to the third parties, because that has been the case in the past 20 years. We need to be very mindful that nobody again exploited and take advantage of this eminatorian hate to people of Afghanistan, whether that's UN with charging 30%, I don't know, sometimes 50 to 70% of administrative costs, or a manipulated government, or an elite, greedy elite in Kabul, which was myself part of it in the past. So that's, that's my humble suggestion that a, as a final suggestion, not for sake of me, but for the sake of the people of Afonso. And thank you once again to you, Professor, for doing a wonderful job. And I enjoyed and I learned so much from the other panelists. Thank you to everyone. And to the audience, of course, that they have made enough to more than two hours to listen to us. Over to you back, Professor. Yeah, it's been a huge pleasure just to hear what everybody else has had to say. I mean, I have my own thoughts on all this, but I really wanted to get a perspective that I've been trying to get for, you know, for months now. What what do the Afghans have to say about this? Um, and and really to get a harder, deeper look at, at how all of you are thinking about these issues rather than thinking about them purely from a what's good for the West perspective. And as you were just saying a second ago, uh, you know, who's to blame for what? and well, you know, I think there are lessons to be learned there, but the big question that has to be tackled right now is what happens to these people? They are literally starving and dying. And that's, you know, pointing fingers at each other right now isn't really going to help them get through this period. And I think there's a question about if the country does go back to a civil war, which looks like could happen within three weeks to three years, then how do we respond? Should we respond? Should we support? Should we engage? I, I'm still not sure that everybody has sorted out their thoughts on that within our governments. And I think that's part of the conversation that's going to happen um, at the G20. So appreciate all of you for contributing to all of this. Um, yeah, this is, um, thank you so much to Danny to Danielle McDivitt, who's helped us organize all of this on behalf of Kings. Um, really grateful to her for all of the support and you know the, the endless changes to the the bios and our and our you know panelist changes and everything else thank you so much danny for all of your help um and we'll post all of this online uh in the coming week or so i hope and thank you so much to all of you for participating and for an excellent conversation so bravo panelists and hopefully things will change on the ground for the better Bye-bye, and uh, see you at another, hopefully at another session in the future.